Hello, everyone. Before we begin this awesome episode of Restaurant Fiction, we want to speak directly to one of our target audiences, and that is the aspiring screenwriters out there. You see, once you have that amazing script, the idea is crystal clear and original, the characters are memorable, the plot is awesome, and it is character-driven. Once you have all this done, and it's at that 99%, but you just need to move the pendulum to that 100, well, you call Lindsay Brits. That's right. Or you email Lindsay Brits. You see, who is Lindsay Brits? Well, she is the most awesome proofreader of any kind of script out there. She does so much more than dot the I's and cross the T's. She checks your script for that 1% of what is working and what's not in terms of grammar, in terms of punctuation, in terms of formatting. Because in the business of Hollywood, that even if you have that 99% A-plus script and there is just one word off or the structure is off, And let's say you don't have a slew of IMDb credits that people remember. And even if you do, but if you have that one little thing that is missing or an error, that could be all of the difference from your script remaining on the desk of an executive, of a producer versus the trash. So before we at Restaurant Fiction send our scripts out We give our scripts. We trust her with all of our artist's soul. We give our scripts to Lindsay Britz. And she not only will if uh, proofread your script, but if you are entering any of the TV and film fellowships this year, she will help you with your essays. So how do you get a hold of Lindsay Britz? Well, first of all, she is on the Twitter and her handle is at Lindsay's tweets that is at L-I-N-D-S-A-Y-S-T-W-E-E-T-S and then if you want to just look her up on her website it's a little long but it is well worth it we will spell it out for you it is scriptproofreading.card.co so let me spell it out so it's S-C-R-I-P-T-P-R-O-O-F R-E-A-D-I-N-G dot C-A-R-R-D dot C-O. Tell, tell Lindsay that Restaurant Fiction sent you and you'll be in good hands and it'll move that 99% A-plus script to that perfect, perfect 100. Bannon? Cut to. Exterior. Interior. Restaurant. Bar. Club. Day. Night. Action! Let me set the stage for everyone. Restaurant fiction. We are at a hotel bar. We are at a hotel called the Flamingo. It is like a straight out of the 1950s retro hotel in Santa Rosa, California, next to the famous Flavortown. If you think Flavortown, the Guy Fieri Flavortown, is a mythological, magical place that does not exist, well, guess what? You are wrong. It does exist, and it is just as magical and just as badass as your imagination ever thought it could and would and should be. Back to the hotel bar. We are sipping, we are sipping something strong. We are sipping something good. Aged, single barrel. And who sits next to us other than chef, food network personality, Justin Warner? Who is Justin Warner? Well, he is what I exactly just said, including the commentator and play-by-play announcer, at least one half of the commentator and play-by-play announcer 
on Guy Fieri's and the Foo Network's Tournament of Champions. Currently, he just came off filming an episode of season four, which is airing as we speak. He orders a drink. Something aged, something single barrel, something good. And he says one word. He says, Tampopo. And then I say, when? And he goes, now. So guess what? Even though our episode, our previous episode with Justin Warner, when we talked about Deadwood, was awesome and memorable. We dropped it like it's hot. We pressed record. And we took a deep dive into probably the quintessential fictional restaurant in all of cinema. And that is the ramen restaurant Tam Popo. This is part one of our incredible conversation with cookbook author, Food Network personality, Marvel aficionado. Yes, he has written the official Marvel cookbook, Chef Justin Warner. Go. Guys, gals, let me break down a generalization. Yes, I'm going to generalize great Japanese cuisine. You see, there is an absurd amount of specialization that comes into Japanese cuisine. Okay, let me now be a little more specific. Let's break down ramen. Now, if you take this that absurd specialization and you put it with ramen, you're going to get a purist. You're going to get a purist that makes ramen poetry. Now, you just don't get to, though, this level. How do you get to this level? Or at least, how do you get to this level when you're serving ramen at a place in an industrial part of Japan called Tampopo? Well, do you learn from Michelin star chef? Do you learn from, you know, the uh, the masters with all of these accolades? No. Your mentors come from off the streets. Your mentors could be the truck driver. You know, that could be the Yoda that walks in or the Gandalf that walks in. And when these Yodas, if you will, teach you, and who knows if they have the three Michelin stars for their background, et cetera, et cetera, you learn and you create, and you master, because that's what you're getting, that quality, at Tempopo. Now, when you walk in, it is uh, the Angelica. Now, I'm not talking about the owner's old place, which was Lilai, because that was bad. Um, we'll get there. That was just bad, Ron. We're talking about the new the new owner's Tempopo, and it's white and angelic, and it has great counter space. Um, it probably seats about eight, and then about 20 can stand in the background, What's amazing is it's not just poetry. It's poetry meets ballet because once you walk in, it is a one-woman band and she runs the front of the house, she runs the back of the house and she does it all. She, When she looks at you, when you walk in, she's not sizing you up if you're drunk uh -uh, or if you're a saint or a sinner. She's sizing you up if you're hungry, if you've been traveling, if you are lonely, if you're meeting friends. And then... She pretty much sizes you up of what kind of bowl of ramen you're going to eat, and she remembers your order. You yell it out, and she remembers it. It doesn't matter if you want an extra egg, if you want extra char siu pork. She knows it, and she whips it out on the fly. Now, let's talk about this ramen, this ramen that she has learned from the Yodas and the Gandalfs and the truck drivers themselves. Well, once again, it's purity that there's a little more umami in the broth than just a pork broth. Yeah, that's right. It's uh, made a little bit with chicken, a little bit with vegetables, aside from the pork, you know, a little bit of mirin or sake for that added sweetness. The noodles, all oh, the noodles, they're fresh noodles. They're springy. They're yellow. They're chewy. That little bit of al dente, but not spongy. And then, of course, the toppings. We're talking about the pork itself. A little more um, 
let's just say, um, you know, it, there's this almost a miso esque taste to the uh, char siu pork just because it is fermented in koju salt. It is beyond anyone's business. And of course, you have the scallions. Now, before you just gulp the ramen down, it is a very, very mindful experience inside Tampopo. You see, you smell it, you savor it, you move the pork over to the side, you just scoop up the broth. Now, let's cut the brass tacks though. I can go on and on and on about the mindful Buddhist Zen-like experience, but really you wanna pay compliments to the chef, the owner, the waiter, the wait, you know, the waitress, the everything. And how do you do that? Do you tip her with money? No. What do you do? You eat and you slurp that bowl clean. So then cleanup for her is as easy as one, two, three. All right, that is our little quick review of the ramen joint Tampopo from the movie, the ramen western instead of the spaghetti western tampopo we have justin warner uh we have sh not only chef but food network personality uh tournament of champions uh play-by-play -play colorful commentator justin warner what do you have to say to that review of tampopo well one hungry two <laughs> i was transported that movie you know and all that you you summarize there like you hit on so many moments in that movie that stuck with me god there are so many opening scenes in that movie but when uh the young guy is with the old guy and he's learning how to eat ramen and he's like set the pork aside i it longingly say i'll see you soon <laughs> like oh my god you know like it, it it's borderline kitsch but i i think that's the thing is like with all things holy there is a little kitsch to make something holy, it has to be un slightly unbelievable. And so to think that you're just going to move the pork aside, caress it, and say, I'll see you soon. I still do it to this day. I, I will never not do that because it is, it's part of the ritual that one makes me smile and two makes sense. You know, you don't want to, you need a little foreplay with ramen, right? Like you don't want to just dive in and eat the, the steak, you only have like two ounces of steak on that thing, you know? So you look at it, you move it to the side, and you say, I'll see you soon. <laughs> that movie is insane, right? It's easily it, the best food movie of all time. It is easily the best food movie because it respects the food. I mean, and and for people who have not seen it, you know, the general story is of a woman on her down and outs, basically, and then this um, mythological truck driving cowboy uh, mentor of like teaches her the ways to make ramen. But then it has these little vignettes uh, that are almost like non sequitur, but yet they're all food related. They're all funny and comedic. I mean, it's like food with eroticism in one with a mobster and then it's um a young guy in a very conservative business meeting who knows more about food than all of these rich you know tokyo business workers like oh that that kid <laughs> oh my god the way they all fan themselves and everybody orders the exact same thing but then he's like no like escargot is that with puff pastry and like just like God, I want to be that. Like, I, I've always been that kid. I just didn't know I was that kid. You know, like, dude, that movie, even from the get-go, when the the movie acknowledges that you are watching a movie and, like, there's almost strangulation over too noisy of a snack, and, like, fuck, pardon my French, you know? Like, I'm sorry, that's not Food Network. That's not PG, but I could gush about every detail, everything to me, like I, there is not a single moment of that movie that is worthy of criticism. I, I think every shot is good. I think the respect to the food is good. I think the acting is good. The story is good. The way they put it all together, man. And I think that might be like the parallel to ramen. And when you, when you finish that movie, it's like the last drops, you know, they are the most special. And like, I feel the movie crescendos as though you're lifting this bowl to your head and pouring and seeing perhaps the message on the bottom of the bowl. I worked at a space that said, 
once. It was called Ichiran, ramen shop. On the bottom of the bowl in Japanese, you would say, like, these are the most special drops. And, like, <laughs> that last, you know, damn, you feel good. The music, it's so, like, orchestral, you know, and big. And, dude, don't forget the, the moment where the homeless guy breaks into the building and teaches the kid how to make an omelet. And then they drink, like, the equivalent of, like, Chateau Lafitte homeless <laughs> you know like and they're ridiculous they all sing a song to someone who's like going to leave the homeless camp and help with the fellowship of the ramen it's insane dude the live killing of a turtle you know like god bro this the sex the egg yolk scene man oh my god before there was uh, american pie and before there was a tell me by your name with the peach Oh, it was Tampopo who really played with the eroticism with food. <laughs> oh, one billion percent, man. Like, get you a girl who lets you dump brandy on a shrimp, live shrimp, and put it on her belly. You know, that's that's not even erotic. That's just fun it, to me. It's like a, imagine a live creature giving you, we call them rat, like Zerberts, you know, when you blow on a baby's belly or something. That's like torturous to an animal. Like, <laughs> You know, it's not torturous because all shrimp are going to die anyway. But and if you're going to die, you might as well go out on a beautiful woman's belly covered in brandy. You know, it's insane. Amen. And then and then even going for that, that story that you're speaking about, you know, that's like the mobster scene. And like his last dying wish, I think, was food related to I forget his last quote. He wanted to eat the yams that had been pre-digested in a, the intestine of a wild boar. Pre, he wanted to eat pre-digested yams. Like that's, you know, like. <laughs> and he's he's still thinking about food. Yeah, even as he's bleeding out in the street, and like losing the love of his life, who clearly is everything to him. The true love of his life is turd yams. <laughs> it's insane. It's insane. I'm glad we could unpack this. I remember telling you at the bar, I was like, "Bro, if if you really think you want to watch a food movie, I got the." the sauce for you i don't know if you knew what, what to expect and i i will say so that was already like i'm just giving the honest that was already like 11 to midnight i went to my room my hotel room and i just watched it and i stayed awake and boom it blew my mind <laughs> yeah yeah i don't know how many viewers have seen it or are familiar with it but uh you know tampopo to me is like a tattoo worthy movie and like you know like i would get a tattoo of like someone caressing the pork longingly or of the the murdered turtle or of any of the the various vignettes you know they all mean so much to me someone just squishing camembert with it, that old lady who <laughs> breaks into stores and just squishes camembert and gets beat with a broom <laughs> you know like i guess you need to see the movie for context but the fact that the writers of this addressed that squishing food is pleasurable like god you know well it's so it's so sensory i mean and and it hits it to to a t from the beginning and moving to the ramen is like we as a, I feel human beings as a i'm i'm a generalization of everyone we're just too rushed in eating like we're yeah. we're just too rushed. It doesn't matter if it's Japanese cuisine, if it's American, if it's Chinese, it doesn't Greek, it doesn't matter. We just want to gobble, gobble, gobble. And like Tampopo is saying, slow the fuck down. Some person put their heart and soul, even if it was boxed craft mac and cheese, they still put their heart. They still said, I love you in some way. So treasure it and be mindful of it. Well, you know that there is a little parable in it in one of these vignettes where the guy unsupervised eats mochi too fast and they have to use a vacuum cleaner to suck it out of his throat. You know, like, I, I don't think they can be more direct about you need to slow down and chew your food, you know. I also think to echo that, you know, one of the things that I, I like to think about when building a dish is I ask, what is it doing? And in that opening scene with the old man, he's like, you know, the bamboo shoots are glistening. You know, the something is floating. This is being hydrated. The soup animates the noodles. You know, like, I, I always try and, like, look at a dish, and especially as a ramen cook, like, I want to know what it what it's doing. And I want, I wish people could take the time to look at it and see how the machine is working and why it's all working together and how it works to become 
delicious. And I, I think a dish is a machine, like with parts that have jobs. And, you know, it, it looks like scallions to you, but it's a sprocket to me. That, I think, the appreciation of the machine is something that, other than like, you know, Mark Summers unwrapped and like conveyor belt porn on YouTube, you know, I, I don't think we really look at everything in our life as a beautiful little machine. And like, that's the kind of ramen I want to make is like a fixed gear bicycle, you know, like where it's just, it works, period. And, and your effort will be rewarded exponentially. That's like how a bicycle works, right? You have a big gear turning a smaller gear. So one revolution of your legs is, uh, you know, three revolutions or whatever, six revolutions of the wheel. And I think that eating when it's at its best is like that, where your effort to consume something is rewarded with pleasure 10 times over. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes 100% sense because it's all about the experience and also um, is providing weight to the experience. You know, I mean, it just goes to even just cooking your own meal, like regardless, you know, or even like, you know what went into it. Or say you went to a restaurant, but you like read the cookbook. So like say, oh, I'm going to get this restaurant or the chef's cookbook. And this recipe is eight pages long. It's like, holy crap, it's an eight page long recipe. And it takes three days to prepare. But then at the restaurant, it's, you know, 25 bucks. Like, holy, like it puts everything into perspective. Yeah, I agree. My shop is 48 hours from bone to bowl. If you fuss about it, if you look about it, if you look at the work that goes into ramen, you'd, you'd be like, man, screw this. You know, like, I'm not doing this. What am I, Amish? You know, like, because it, everything is so long and time consuming. But I look at most food as either you prep really hard and cook very light or you cook very hard and prep very light. Does that make sense? And ramen is very much like, I actually call it like, it's like a fixed gear bicycle. It's like, harder to stop than it is to start. If we were to try and like have a, we have a blizzard here right now. If we were to try and like deplete the walk-in, it would take us another two days to build back our stores to come back. You know what I mean? And so like, I think that's another great thing about like ramen is that it, it should be a food consumed in a restaurant because the restaurant is the only place that has the, the power and the space to do it, to make it worth it. No, I love it. I mean, as long as, I mean, because Tampopo, as long as you're not uh, doing whatever you have to do to steal someone's trade secrets, or at least doing it above the line and not below the line, not just like looking through the trash, be like, oh, they're using a little more chicken and leftover vegetable scraps. And, oh, I see a sake bottle. Oh, yeah. So I, I don't want to confuse anyone by recommending another ramen movie, but there's another ramen movie called Ramen Heads. And one of the most mind-blowing moments in this movie uh there it's more of a documentary they're interviewing this guy who has gotten you know the best ramen by whatever standard in japan and they're like hey like you're showing us how you do all this are you worried that somebody's going to copy it and he's like you know i have like kind of a hate relationship with with trade secrets i think the biggest trade secret is that no one's doing anything innovative Whoa, you know, like sick burn, like, you know, the kernels, you know, 11 secrets, of herbs and spices, it's just like dryer lint or something, you know, like it, it's just like junk, you know, like that, that to me. And so we, we have an open source kitchen. So I let everyone in. I literally have a recipe for a sauce, the dumpling sauce. It lives on the photocopier so that when a customer says, I could drink that by the court, I run back to the office, press copy, spits out the recipe. Here, take the recipe, make it at home. You know, for our audience out there, so Justin's Ramen Shop, it's called Bakujo Ramen. It is in Rapid City, South Dakota. Yeah. Awesome. So, and that's what he's talking about, guys. So if you're in the Rapid City area with the blizzard going on or when it's not, just go. But anyway, how did Tampopo inspire Okujo Ramen? Well, so I uh, – and let me know if you can't hear me. I'm just grabbing a beer real quick because um, it's a snow day. It's a long story, man. I, I worked in Japanese cuisine in Fort Collins, Colorado when I – oh, I guess I was – I turned 21 at that restaurant. So I must have been 19 or 20. And I, I met a Japanese dude whose English wasn't great, 
but his love of fish was great. And so we worked together to create a fish scatter plot with fishy and not fishy and oily and not oily on the X and Y axis respectively. So he could show to the customers like, hey, if you're gonna try mackerel, it's gonna be extremely fishy and extremely oily, and it's gonna be in the lower right extreme quadrant of the, the scatter plot. And we never made ramen there, but we, that guy and I cooked together and it really, it inspired me to, to taste like he tasted and to get as good as he was. And then from there, he owned the bookshop in Denver and the bookshop also had movies. So we'd watch like random Japanese game shows and stuff where like the winner, winner of the game show gets a Matsutake mushroom and the loser gets an Enoki mushroom. And to me, that is extremely funny. <laughs> like, <laughs> like here's your shit ass prize. It's like practically free mushrooms, <laughs> you know, Enoki. Anyway. Um, and so I got hooked and then I moved to uh, New York and I found a Japanese book and video store and I had heard tales about this movie, Tampopo. And then um, I still not had ramen and I watched the movie having never had ramen. Of course I had instant ramen, but I had never had the real deal. And so I watched the movie and I was like, I, this is clicking so effing hard right now. I need to find ramen. And so I went to a place in the Lower East Side called Satagaya or Satagaya. I did everything that I learned from the movie. I moved the pork, I caressed it, I looked at it longingly, I finished the bowl, and I was hooked for life. And then then from there, I just kept chasing bowls and chasing soup. And then my wife ended up working at a ramen shop owned by Morimoto's sous chef from Iron Chef. His name was Jameson, it still is, Jameson Blankenship, and his uh, cadre of cats at Chuko Ramen in Brooklyn. And once she started working there, you know, I kind of had I'm not saying unlimited access to eating ramen, but I, you know, I pick her up from work. I'm going to get a bowl, you know, period, the end. I loved all of the things that they were doing. And then I think one of the biggest turning points in my life is I started working for Ichiran, which was not in America until I worked for them. And I didn't work with them until I, until it opened. I worked to help with their staff in the opening because that place is insane. You know, you eat in a cubby. And the food appears through a window with like human hands, but you never have to see anyone in it so that you can have your own relationship with the ramen without being judged by spectators. Yeah. And, and when I realized that that is actually a thing, and when I factored in all the stuff I learned from Tampopo, like my wife and I, we don't talk when we eat ramen. We literally will say goodbye to each other. We say goodbye, like I'll see you at the end of this. And to me, the reverence that Tampopo instills in how to eat and how to appreciate. It made me want to make food that had you seen Tampopo and you eat my ramen and you kind of like are part of that, like Dharma, I hate that term. I wanted to make food that compelled you. When you lift the bowl, you are rewarded 10 times over, if not through flavor, calorically. There's a scene where they're like, look, watch how they move, watch how they move. No wasted effort. And to me, like that's a bike. A bike is no wasted effort. And there's something about the perfection of this. And I keep coming back to it, but like that to me is what great ramen is about. There's no wasted effort by you. There is no wasted the consumer. There's no wasted effort by the chef. The noodles are doing their job. The roots are doing their job. The pork is doing its job. It's like a human body now, right? Specialization of cells. And that to me is, there is no more beautiful thing. You know, like I feel like, Leonardo da Vinci's, you know, Bowflex looking guy. That's what I see when I see a bowl, you know, like a well-crafted bowl of ramen. To me, it's like this most harmonious thing that's about ratios and like the golden spiral and drugs, you know, after that, <laughs> you know, like, and, and Tampopo unlocked that, you know, and I don't know, maybe it was seeing the, the dead turtle, you know, maybe it was seeing a guy get mochi sucked out of his mouth with a vacuum cleaner. There's just something about the way that movie compels you to change how you think about food. And I wanted to make that in real life. I wanted to be Tampopo. Or I, I wanted to be the, the cowboy. I don't know if he's Goro or Gun. He's Goro, and Gun is his. Goro and Gun also, I think in Canada, that exists as a restaurant concept, but I think that would be the best Japanese steakhouse in your life, Goro and Gun. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's, we're going to break this down, but... Please. Let's talk about... Goro for a second. So for the people who have not seen it, Goro is this 
like a just a truck driving cowboy. He wears like this Indiana Jones esque cowboy hat, uh, fedora esque cowboy hat. He's driving a truck with his uh, companion. Yeah, and he teaches Tampopo all about the meaning and how to not only cook amazing specialization bicycle perfection ramen, but also run a restaurant by herself, be the one woman band by herself. Now, now we're going to break that down. Let's talk about this mentor. Like, how important is this mythological mentor? Like, he is not, we don't know, he's not coming from a Michelin star, like, oh, I I'm I'm trained by Joel Robichon or I'm trained by Eric. Like, we don't know. He is just a cowboy from the street. Boom. Justin, I'm going to teach you how to make ramen. Like, it's a lot about mentor, like trust. It's a lot about mentor mentee relationships. Uh, what is your thoughts on this? You know, that's, there's a lot to unpack about mentorship, because I, I think we've all in our lives had people that have sought to mentor us, but have either been not effective or perhaps even harmful to be a good mentor. You have to see that trying to force someone to do it your way is not it. Someone has to come to their own terms and find your way. You know, it's like leaving a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. I know that's like super cliche, but I think you need to provide the inspiration, the push, the nudge, the bumpers in the, in the bowling lane to get someone so that they find their own trajectory and their own path. You know, when I was being mentored by Alton Brown on a Food Network Star, he said, listen, dude, you got to get a head on your shoulders. I'm just going to get out of your way. And to me, that that was the push that, that was like heard around the world. You know, like that was the push in my life where it was like, if this guy who is world class can say like, yeah, I believe in you, just go do it. Huge. So what did he do? What dial did he fiddle with? The confidence dial. That's the only thing. And how did he fiddle with it? By not touching it. You know, when I work with Guy, Guy is the, you know, the food football coach extraordinaire, right? He wants everyone to be best. He wants everyone to get in there and play the game. And speaking of, you know, Tournament of Champions season three, uh, now we're on season four. But last year, uh, there was a, a cat, Tobias Dorzon, who actually is a rec like recovering NFL player, former NFL player, I should say. I don't think it was the worst thing for him. He was being panicked, and so Guy had a little coach-like chat with him and said, like, look, you've already won. You know, you don't even need the ring. You, you've already made it to the Super Bowl. And, like, Guy just did the exact same thing, where by not fiddling with the dials, by not trying to give some sort of pep talk, by, by just saying, like, hey, like, let's look at where we are. We're here. Now let's go do this. That to me, I think, is the the best sort of mentorship. I don't I don't think that mentors need to be experts in a field. I think they need to be experts in you and experts in communication and understanding how, if you're the horse and the goal is water, how are they going to make sure that you're at your damn thirstiest once you get to that water? Goro and Tempopo, like I think he, you know, in the movie, there's this opening bout of confidence where he's just like, hey, don't cause shit in this lady's restaurant. I'm going to beat all these guys up six to one. I don't care. And I'll, I'll pass out doing it. I, I think she looks at that confidence and the physicality of the confidence. And then you see they go on this like Rocky S. There are moments of it where it has nothing to do with food. It's like, can you lift a pot, lady? You know, can you lift a pot 600 times? I always said, man, the ramen shop diet is real. What's the ramen shop diet? Just carry a bunch of hot liquids for the rest of your life. <laughs> like, you're 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 gonna get chiseled, cut from just like 40 quarts. Like, you don't need dumbbells. Just lift 40 quarts over and over and over and over. And then when it's hot, you pay the price for your inability to to not lift 40 quarts. And I I think that the movie does a great job of um of showing one, the physicality of cooking, but after it, it transcends that, and then they go into the more nuanced stuff, it's less him mentoring her and more the supervision of experience and making sure that she is having the best curated experience so that she can take it in. So like when they go to the subway and they see the eight seat thing that gets a subway rush, and she's watching is how like the the ramen cook can remember all the orders, all the orders. This guy's no skines. This guy's extra skines. This guy's classic with pork and blah, 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 blah. It's just so much. And so he doesn't do anything to her. 
he doesn't say like more reps. He says, observe, and you're going to observe some of the best in the business. I think mentorship can be that, which is just like, watch how this happens and filter from it like what you may. For everyone listening, and they do not want to wait for part two of our continuation with Chef Justin Warner. Well, guess what? Watch Chef Justin Warner on Tournament of Champions Season 4, airing on the Food Network as we speak. He is one half of the play-by-play announcer, the colorful commentator in what is the best and biggest food competition out there. And when you are done watching Justin, go to the library, go to Amazon, go to your local independent bookstore and cookbook store and get his work, including, I'm not going to lie, the official Marvel cookbook. And I believe it is called Marvel Eat the Universe. And if you want to meet Justin, go to Rapid City, South Dakota. He is probably going to be there when he is not either at a Marvel premiere or helping out a Food Network show. And that is called Boku Joe Ramen. Say hi. Send our love to him and his family and savor and yet devour the awesomeness that he makes which is ramen, by the way. Until next time, which will be our continuation part two with Justin Warner, this is Restaurant Fiction. My name is Manus Rose. And as always, keep it real, keep it fresh, and keep it on the flip side. Cut to. Exterior. Interior. Restaurant. Bar.